Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So it was a couple of years ago that I was helping Elijah get ready. I was going to take him on his first Cub Scout campout. Elijah's my oldest son, if you don't know. He's somewhere in the front up here. So we followed all the right steps. And it had been a little while since either of us had done any camping. So we were very careful to follow all the right steps. We got the right gear, you know, the sleeping bags, the tents, the sleeping mats, the camp chairs, the right clothes in case it rains, the food that we were supposed to bring, to, you know, to help to cook. We followed all the right steps. Then we followed all the right steps to load it all into the van carefully so that everything wasn't piled on top of the food and that sort of thing. And then we followed all the right steps driving to the park and we got there and we were the only ones there. Because I'd driven us to the wrong park. It was the wrong destination. And when you're pointed toward the wrong destination, all of the steps that got you there, no matter how much they seemed like the right step at the time, actually turn out to have been the wrong steps because they all took you to the wrong place. That's something that we're familiar with in our lives. If you're pointed toward the wrong destination, then every step, no matter how much it might seem like the right step, actually is the wrong step because it's leading you in the progress the wrong direction. If we don't understand the right destination, then the steps will also be wrong. Now this is valuable because throughout this Lenten season, I've been encouraging us to think of Lent as a journey more than as a season. Because a season just comes to an end and gives way to another season. But a journey has a destination. And the Lenten season also has a destination. And we're arriving at that now with Holy Week, starting with Palm Sunday, and then Jesus establishing the Lord's Supper on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, his death at the cross, and uh, spoiler alert, Easter Sunday, when he rises triumphant over the grave. That was the destination of the Lenten journey. And our lives can be compared to a Lenten journey as well, through difficulty and darkness, but toward a definite destination. So because we've been talking so much about a journey and a destination, it becomes helpful to understand that when the destination is wrong, then all the steps that led you there, no matter how right they seemed at the time, were also wrong. Now, good news. We were able, because of cell phones, to be able to figure out where the rest of the pack actually was. We were only about half an hour late, which if you've ever been to these things, is nothing at all. So everything turned out relatively okay. Does that what happened, though? Is, did everything turn out relatively okay with that first Palm Sunday? Because they took a lot of steps, and those steps certainly seemed right at the time. But they were pointed toward the wrong destination. And we know from our experiences, if the destination is wrong, then the steps that get us there are also wrong. So let's take a look again at that gospel passage that we looked at. It's on the inside of your bulletin this week. The first step that we see them take on that very first Palm Sunday is a step that Jesus instructed them to take, boiling it down, verses 28 through 35. He says, go into town and you're going to find a small donkey and I want you to untie it and bring it to me. And because the owner might somewhat wonder why you're taking his donkey, which would otherwise appear an awful lot like theft, just say the Lord has need of him. And then they follow the step as he instructed. They do exactly what he said and they bring the donkey to him. So it certainly seems like the right step. But it starts their thought process and their minds on a little bit of the wrong direction. It would be easy for us to miss. We think of riding on a donkey as being a relatively humble mode of transportation. Far more likely when we think of ancient times and a king riding, we don't think of a slow little donkey, do we? We think of a big, strong charger of a horse, right? So we don't think that this would have been that big of a deal. It certainly seems lowly, like we were just singing in the hymn. But those first listeners, whether they were Jesus' apostles or probably even the owner of the donkey, would probably have been familiar with a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, a prophecy about Jerusalem, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
So when Jesus told his apostles to go and find a young donkey and the apostles tell the owner, the Lord has need of him, there would be some bells going off in their minds that this is significant because the one who enters Jerusalem riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, is the one who is declared in the Old Testament to be the king, the one who would bring the great and glorious day of the Lord. And so as they follow this step, they're thinking, King of kings and Lord of lords. They're thinking he's on his way to the capital city of the promised land so that he can establish his throne, so that he can establish his kingdom. And they're thinking of all the things that were promised when that was supposed to happen, that he would lead the holy armies to defeat their enemies forever, that he would establish his throne. This is then carried through in the next step, or the next thing that we see unfolding, beginning with verse 36. They put him on the donkey, seated on their cloaks, and he rides into the city, and they lay their cloaks down on the road in front of him. And in one of the other gospel passages, it records those who didn't even have a cloak, they're cutting palm branches off of the trees. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. They're, cut, they're cutting palm branches off of the trees, laying them down on his road. Now, why would they do that? They do that because all the roads are dirt, which means if it's a dry day, it's dusty. And this way, he doesn't even get covered with the dust of the road. And if it's not a dry day, it's even worse. It's muddy and he would get spattered and dirty. And they're willing to lay down their own cloaks or to go and find palms to lay down. Again, the symbolism from the Old Testament would be very, very strong. Remember Isaiah chapter 40? We tend to quote it more during Christmas time than during Easter time, but where it says, prepare a highway in the wilderness for the Lord. That's what they were doing. These were the actions that you would do for a king, or at least for a conquering hero. And it's carried through even more powerfully when we hear what they're saying while they're laying down their cloaks and their palms. They're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. If we read some of the other gospel accounts, we say Hosanna, which means save us, to the son of David, which again is rich with Old Testament prophecy, this time 2 Samuel 7, where David was promised that a son of his would reign on the throne forever and establish God's kingdom for all of time, ruling over his enemies. Again, when we see what they're doing, we see what they believe the destination is. They think he's the king of kings and the lord of lords who's coming to the capital city of the promised land so he can sit on the throne, so that he can lead an army that will be victorious over their foes and establish his earthly kingdom forever. No wonder they were celebrating so greatly. And so far, they followed all the right steps. Which means that what Jesus says is surprising. First, there's this little interlude with the Pharisees. They're concerned about this hubbub and all that it might mean because the things that all the people are saying, those are treason. When you're part of a Roman Empire, those things are treason and they're concerned about what the outcome is going to be. Besides, they haven't been big fans of Jesus' for a while. And so they say, you should rebuke your disciples and he answers, again, alluding to some of the Psalms, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. We think of all the, psalm, the Psalms that talk about all of nature singing God's praises. That's when Jesus does something unexpected and we get the first glimpse that they've misunderstood the destination of this particular journey. Because when Jesus draws near and he sees the city, he weeps over it, saying, would that you, speaking to Jerusalem as a whole, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. They're crying out, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He's saying, I wish that you knew the things that really do bring peace. But they're hidden from your eyes. The days are coming when you're going to be besieged, you're going to be conquered, your city, every stone is going to be torn down. And they won't leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. But honestly, what more could he have wanted at this point? Everything they could have done to indicate that he was their king, 
that he was their Lord, that he was their Savior, that's what they've done. They've set up the parade the way that he told them to set it up. They've laid down their cloaks, they've laid down their palms, they've sung their songs, and they've shouted their shouts that all say that this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords heading to his throne and establishing his kingdom. Why is it that he says they've missed it? Why is it he says that they've misunderstood and that they're pointed toward the wrong destination? Well, we know with the perspective of history what they did not know. They thought he was going to lead a physical army that would defeat the Roman army, and he was going to establish a physical throne, and he would rule from the physical city of Jerusalem over a physical kingdom. And he had much bigger plans than that. We know that he was not marching with an earthly army toward an earthly throne. He was marching instead toward the cross. That the army that he would command would not be an earthly one, but a heavenly one. That the kingdom that he would establish would not be an earthly kingdom because those come and go, but would be an eternal, heavenly kingdom. That the foes that he would defeat, because here's the one thing history teaches us, there are always more foes out there somewhere. The foes that he would defeat would not be the Romans or the Egyptians or any kingdom. That the foes that he would defeat would be sin and death and the devil that he was coming to be king of kings and lord of lords in eternity. He had far bigger fish to fry than establishing a small kingdom in the Middle East. He was establishing a kingdom that would stretch not only all the way around the globe, but throughout eternity. They had misunderstood the destination. They thought he was heading maybe for the temple, maybe for the throne. He was heading for the cross and beyond it, for the heavenly throne, so that he could be a savior in ways that they hadn't even predicted, that they hadn't even expected, so that he could be the king, not just for one generation or for one area of the world, but for all generations, for all time, and for all of the world. They had misunderstood the destination. And when we misunderstand the destination, what does that mean about every step that got us there? If it's the wrong destination, those must have been the wrong steps, right? That's what human wisdom teaches us. Here's the greatest beauty of Palm Sunday. Everything they expected was wrong. Every word they said was right. It's incredible to think about it, but listen to the things that they said. For instance, they said, the Lord has need of it, in referring to the donkey. Was Jesus, in fact, their Lord? Yes, not in the earthly way they thought, but in a much more powerful and much more meaningful way. They cried out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Was Jesus the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Yes, just not in the way that they understood yet. They cried out, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Are those the things that Jesus was bringing? They cried out in the other gospels, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Things that we ourselves still say, every liturgy, when we receive Jesus, not as a king on a throne, but through bread and through wine, through his body and through his blood, something we're going to talk a great deal more about on Thursday night as we remember Monday, Thursday, and the first Lord's Supper. This is the beautiful thing about Lent. This is the beautiful thing about Palm Sunday. This is the beautiful thing about our Christian walk. Even their wrong steps, God was able to use to proclaim his glory. Even when they were wrong, God was able to bring it to the right destination. Our theme throughout the season of Lent on the Sundays has been repentance and renewal. And that's the beauty of repentance and renewal, or of confession and absolution. That even when we sin, even when we fail, even when we fall, if we are willing in humility to turn back to God through Christ, to plead for His forgiveness and to recognize that our strength is found only in Him, then those things that would have been a defeat, those times that Satan thought that he had gotten us, become things that drive us further and deeper into Christ's love and Christ's grace, that point us all the more strongly towards the cross where we receive forgiveness and renewal and life. Our, even our wrong steps, this is the beauty of Palm Sunday, even our wrong steps, God can use to bring us to the right destination. Because every word they said, they misunderstood. 
And yet God, in his mercy and grace, knew that every word they spoke was true. They misunderstood his destination. We do that all the time. We think we've got Jesus figured out. We think we've got it figured out where he's going to take us. We think we've got it figured out the path. We think we've got it figured out the way we're going to arrive. And time and time and again, as he did during his earthly life, as he did to them, he surprises us. The destination's a little different from what we thought. But the beauty of our Lenten journey, the beauty of the triumphant entry at Palm Sunday, even though we know it's ironic, they don't understand what they're saying, the beauty is that God can even use our wrong steps to guide us toward His truth. Because we've been told through Christ something that they had not yet grasped, something that hopefully we can be reminded of over and over again and continue to pray that we would grasp, that our ultimate destination is not earthly success, our ultimate destination is not earthly contentment, it's not even earthly character, although those are all things that we pray for and that God helps to guide us towards. But our ultimate destination is with Christ in His eternal kingdom, around not an earthly throne, but an eternal throne, supported not by an earthly army, but by the heavenly hosts, reigning with Him forever. That's the ultimate destination. And thank God that in His grace and mercy, even our missteps can be steps that He can use to take us to that perfect destination in Christ. And may the peace of God that, God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.